You're listening to Nest Talk, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. Now, here's your host, Christopher Linfont. Ladies and gentlemen of the Ravens flock, my name is Christopher Linfont, bringing you another episode of the Nest Talk podcast. Nest Talk episode 45 is being recorded uh, on September 20th, Friday, September 20th, at about 1.30 in the afternoon, and ladies and gentlemen, we have a great show coming up for you today. Fantastic show, of course, as you always know, you can find here at Nest Talk. But before we go into news, opinions, and whatnot, we do have to cover some of the housekeeping, as always. If you are listening on the YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe to the Baltimore Feather YouTube page, which you would have to be listening to it on if you are listening on YouTube. If you're listening on iTunes, make sure you subscribe on iTunes, leave us a rating there, thumbs up on YouTube as well. Uh, and I always like to hear your constructive comments, so leave them as well, uh, whether it's on iTunes or on YouTube. Um, if you are looking to interact with me, Chris Linfont, you can find me at Chris Linfont on Twitter, or of course, you can hit us up at Be More Feather or at Nest Talk on Twitter as well. If you want to follow us on Facebook to make sure you get all the latest Baltimore Ravens news um, and opinions in your feed, on your Facebook feed, you can find us by searching up Baltimore Feather or Nest Talk on Facebook, and of course, finally, make sure you go to BaltimoreFeather.com and register for our newsletter. All it takes is a single email address, and that email address will be the gateway for you to the latest Ravens news and opinion articles that we pop out um, every week. So make sure you do that as well, and of course, every time we upload a Nest Talk podcast, the podcast you are listening to right now, you will be notified by any of those avenues you so choose to um, subscribe to, to to sign up for a newsletter to, or just to interact with us on. So make sure you do that. It's always helpful to us, and of course it's helpful to you. And of course, again, I do want to hear constructive comments about the podcast. We are going to try to expand the podcast to a wider audience uh, in the coming weeks, so we do want to make sure that we have the absolute best podcast commentary coming out to you guys. Um, so if there's any sort of segments you want to hear, any any changes you would like to see made to the podcast, I am all ears um, shoot me a comment, tweet, DM, whatever you, it may be. Um, just always great to hear from you guys. So without any further ado, I do want to jump into the episode today. Now, there isn't a whole lot of Ravens news, and depending on who you ask, that could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. The good news is no one's really, um, you know, terribly hurt. Nobody is in a situation where we're having surprises thrown at us. But, of course, the other news is, the, the flip side of this news, the, the no news, um, is that there's nothing really um, super exciting going on this week. There are some things that are exciting, and that's more of an opinionated section. We'll get to that, which will be our longer segment of the day. But, of course, uh, we do have to go over the few, two news pieces we have. And the, the two pieces that we actually have here, injury report news um, and a practice squad signing that's actually somewhat surprising. So... We're going to talk about injury first. That is the most important facet to this Baltimore Ravens team. Who is injured? Who is healthy? Going into this Week 3 matchup against the Kansas City Chiefs, it's going to be the most difficult matchup they face, maybe all season, bar the Patriots game. Um, So we'll talk about that later in the episode. But of course, who is injured going into this game? We have five Ravens who are listed on the injured report um, from Thursday's practice. Don't know what's going on Friday yet. Today is Friday. Haven't heard anything out of Owings Mills um, so far. If anything interrupts me during the episode, I will let you know. But um, we have some five players here that are on the injured report. And the first one is obvious. It's Jimmy Smith. He's not participating. Um, They're not going to put Jimmy Smith on the IR. If you didn't follow what happened to Jimmy Smith, essentially he got an MCL sprain in the opening game against the Miami Dolphins. They will not be putting Jimmy Smith on the injured reserve anytime soon. Um... And the reason for that is they want to make sure he's available whenever he comes back healthy. Injured reserve, I believe it's about a six-week um, wait time. Even if he's healthy after a week, it'd be six weeks. So they don't want to do that. They elevated Maurice Kennedy last week to fill out some depth in the, the cornerback position. Um, but Jimmy Smith is still out. He's not participating in practice. He's not practicing at all, not doing anything with that MCL sprain. And, and that's fine. Let him heal up. The Ravens are already deep. Uh, at corner, although they are missing now Smith and Tavon Young. So it's no surprise here that Jimmy Smith did not participate in Thursday's practice. Um, what is maybe somewhat surprising is Brendan Trawick 
the cornerback slash special teams gunner um, did not practice as well. I am not exactly 100% certain as to what his injury is, but he did not practice at all on Thursday. And for the Ravens, that definitely could be a problem. Brendan Trawick um, had a, had some good plays in the first two games um, on special teams. That's where he makes his money. That's why he's here. Not so much to play corner. That's his his listed position. But he he's a gunner. He's going to go down the field, make tackles on um, punts, kickoffs, punt returns, all of those kinds of plays. Now, the Ravens definitely want to have him back, but. It's not the end of the world if they don't. They already have Justin Bethel at Gunner, who also plays corner as well for that depth. Um, So the Ravens don't really need Brendan Trowick to play if he's not available to play this Sunday. But it would be an added bonus to put him next to Justin Bethel. Um, But Justin Bethel really is the leader of that special teams unit so far this year. um, Trowick was brought in kind of as an afterthought, but made the team after a strong preseason performance. So... Um, again, he had some good plays in the first two games, but he has not practiced this week, um, or at least this Thursday and this Wednesday, I don't believe. Um, so we will not really know until we get inactives, uh, our inactives list this Sunday, whether he or not he's going to play. Um, Pat Ricard, the fullback slash defensive tackle was listed as a limited participant in Thursday's practice. That is somewhat concerning for the Ravens. They are already low on defensive tackles. Uh, I believe they're only carrying five. This year, it's Pat Ricard, um, Michael Pierce, um, Brandon Williams, Chris Wormley, and Pat Ricard. So, um, did I say Pat Ricard twice? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But anyway, they're only carrying four or five. Pat Ricard is one of them, and he's actually a very good player. He's really come up this year. The preseason was, was fantastic for him at fullback and defensive tackle. Pat Ricard had a phenomenal um preseason a very 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 good preseason he has impressed at fullback at defensive tackle this year as well uh really shines a fullback to be honest this Ravens offense needs an extra blocker in there at times someone who can pound on the ground too for a couple yards they don't want to subject Lamar Jackson to that Pat Ricard is the guy but with him being limited in practice against the Kansas City Chiefs his availability is unknown whether or not he's going to play um if I had to bet I'd say he probably will play because he at least practiced a little bit and there's still time between now, it's Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday to heal up. If he's practicing a little bit, I would imagine he can play, but we'll we'll see. Um, I'm no doctor. I don't know any of the inside information that the Ravens have and they're not releasing to us, but Pat Ricard was a limited participant. Um, Earl Thomas is actually on this list as well, but the good thing about Earl Thomas is he's not listed as did not participate or uh, limited participant, and that's because he is a full participant in this week's uh, Thursday practice, which is very, very good news for the Baltimore Ravens here. Um, Earl Thomas obviously is the leader of this secondary. Even though it's his first year in Baltimore, he is perhaps the best free safety in the National Football League. Him being on this secondary really helps him out, and he didn't get a pick last week against Kyler Murray, but um, he did get the pick against um, I believe it was Ryan Fitzpatrick at the time of the Miami Dolphins game before he was replaced by Rosen. Um, so he is very, very integral to this Ravens secondary unit, and Earl Thomas is a full participant. I don't know what his injury was this week, what would have put him on this list, but the good news is he is a full participant. I believe he had a vet day yesterday uh, on Thursday, or Wednesday, I'm sorry. Um I believe he had a, a vet day on Wednesday. Maybe that's why he's on this list to confirm that he will. He was a full participant and he's not being feared of uh, missing out of the game or anything. Uh, and finally, we have Mark Andrews listed as limited. I believe he was listed as limited last week's um, in last week's practice. Obviously, it didn't do anything to slow him down. 100 yards receiving for the second week in a row. Um, you know, as long as Mark Andrews plays for the Baltimore Ravens, they should not be concerned. Um, he is becoming a fantastic tight end in this league, but it is concerning that he's a limited participant here. Um, I cannot say whether or not I think he's going to play. I mean, he played last week, and I believe, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that Mark Andrews was limited in practice before last week's game against the Cardinals. So if that means anything to you, then there's a good chance he's going to play. Although, again, we're not going to know until we get that inactives list before the game on Sunday. Um, Notably absent from this list is someone who was on it for the past two weeks, and that's Marquise Brown. 
appears to be a full participant. We haven't heard anything uh, to the contrary. And he was injured um, again throughout most of the offseason, came in the preseason, did well, broke out in the first game, had a great, great game against Arizona. Not 100 yards receiving, but it was 80-some and had a spectacular catch essentially to seal the game at the end. Um, and Marquise Brown, not on this list, is is fantastic. He's no longer limited to practice. Maybe he can become even faster. Who knows if that's even possible. But Marquise Brown, um, again, not on this list. That's a good sign for the Ravens um, heading into week three when they're definitely going to need some offensive firepower. Um, the next piece of news we have here, and the only other piece of news for the week, is that the Ravens made a signing on their practice squad, and that signing is Cole Herdman, the tight end that spent a lot of time in the preseason with the Baltimore Ravens. This past preseason, he was an undrafted um, rookie. Now he is back with Baltimore on the practice squad. And the reason the Ravens are making this move is somewhat unclear, but they did have to fill in um, somebody for Mark Thompson. And they're not cutting Mark Thompson. I said last week I like Mark Thompson a lot of running back. He has tremendous upside, spent time with the Ravens in last year's preseason. Mark Thompson was not cut. He was put on the practice squad injured list. Um, We don't know what exactly Mark Thompson's injury is. We just know that he is no longer able to participate in practice squad duties at this time. So the Ravens needed to fill his practice squad spot, and that's why they went after Cole Herdman. Why a tight end over a running back? I'm not exactly sure. I know they've signed Mark Thompson to come in and kind of replace Delance Turner for a little bit on the practice squad as he was a little banged up. Um, but Cole Herdman, tight end, it, it makes you wonder a little bit. And we're going to talk about, right after this actually, why I'm wondering a little bit about this signing. But Cole Herdman had a lot of upside. I believe Charles Scarf, the other tight end undrafted, is on this practice squad as well. So they're kind of doubling down here on tight ends. Um, and maybe that's because, as we segue into our next segment of the opinions here, Maybe that's because they're going to trade away Hayden Hurst. What if I told you the Ravens... Now, this is completely conjecture here. I haven't heard anything substantial out of Owings Mills, but there are people who are suggesting that the Ravens are going to trade Hayden Hurst for Jalen Ramsey. Again, this is nothing substantial, but Jalen Ramsey wants out of the, of Jacksonville. The Baltimore Ravens were very, very interested in Jalen Ramsey coming out of college, FSU, fantastic cornerback, one of the best in the league. The Ravens have a need at cornerback. The Ravens have been linked in reports. Josina Anderson last night said the Ravens have inquired about Jalen Ramsey. So would it surprise you if the Ravens traded away Hayden Hurst, who is not the best tight end on this team? They drafted in the first round, being outplayed by Mark Andrews. They don't need him like they need Nick Boyle to block. Hayden Hurst is kind of this weird outlier on the offense. He just doesn't really fit. I mean, he has upside, but it's not like he's dominating in any specific sense um, or any specific portion of the game. Hayden Hurst could be traded to Jacksonville, and I'm not going to suggest they do it. I'm actually very, very, very like up in the air on acquiring Jalen Ramsey. I think there's a lot of reasons that are good and a lot of reasons that are bad two after Ramsey, but a lot of people are suggesting the Ravens would trade Hayden Hurst and a first-round pick to get a hold of Ramsey and potentially push this team towards the Super Bowl. Now, I don't know if that would push the team towards the Super Bowl. I think it would make the team tremendously better on paper to get Ramsey, and then when Jimmy Smith comes back, it's going to be a tremendously good um, secondary, and that's what he would bring to the team. He would upgrade this defense tremendously on paper, but... Uh, again, implications of the trade here, you have to ship away a first-round pick. You have to ship away something else, too, with that first-round pick that the, the Jacksonville Jaguars would value. Hayden Hurst could be that piece of capital to trade away with the first-round pick simply because the Jacksonville Jaguars, I mean, they're kind of devoid on offense, really, except for Leonard Fournette. Um, they don't really have great wide receivers right now. They have Gardner Minshew, a quarterback. He's going to need some some safety blankets here. We're not using Hayden Hurst in the way we thought we were going to use him when we drafted him first um, first round a couple years ago in the Lamar Jackson draft in 2018. Um, if we traded away Hayden Hurst, they would be getting a tight end with massive potential on his rookie deal. 
and a first round pick, we would be getting Jalen Ramsey. Who, I mean, imagine the secondary for a moment. Imagine the secondary because this is the implication here. Cornerback one, Jalen Ramsey. Cornerback two, Marlon Humphrey. Cornerback three, Jimmy Smith. Cornerback four, Brandon Carr. Each one of those cornerbacks could start, be the number one cornerback on any given team in this league, and we could have them all on the same team. This would be bigger than the Legion of Boom. This would be bigger than the Seattle defense ever was. This would be could even be bigger. I mean, it's maybe minus a pass rush here, but could be bigger than the Ravens 2000. I mean, that's the implication we're talking about here if the Ravens acquire Jalen Ramsey. And I'm not saying it would, he would make him go to the Super Bowl or anything, but to, to assemble a secondary with that amount of talent on it, with that amount of prestige that will strike fear into enemies to every offense they face. I don't care if it's Pat Mahomes. I don't care if it's Tom Brady. I don't care if it's Mason Rudolph now starting for the the Pittsburgh Steelers. No quarterback in this league will want to go up against the secondary, especially with Earl Thomas and Tony Jefferson in the backfield, back of that secondary. Like, are you kidding me? If you just think about that for a moment, what Jalen Ramsey would actually bring to this defense to make it the undisputed best secondary of the league and perhaps the best secondary of all time, depending on how it happens. Now, here's the deal, though. Jalen Ramsey might not actually be traded anymore. And, and the reason I say that is because he played last night in Jacksonville's win over the Tennessee Titans. And the win part is extremely important to this Jalen Ramsey saga because Jalen Ramsey wanted out of Jacksonville because they were just sucking it up in the first few games. I mean, it was it, it, it was bad. The first couple of games with the Jacksonville Jaguars, not so hot, not so hot at all. They started 0-2, I believe, not what Doug Marone thought they were going to start as, not what Jalen Ramsey thought they were going to start as. But now you have Jalen Ramsey coming off of a win, a very good win. Gardner Minshew looked pretty darn good last night. I didn't watch any of it, but I looked at the stats. Um... And now the question is, would Jalen Ramsey still want to trade? He has no qualms with Doug Marone, the coach. He just doesn't, apparently reports are saying he doesn't like Mike Tomlin, who's running the team as GM, basically. De facto GM, I don't think he's actually titled GM, but he's running the team. He doesn't like Tom Coughlin, and if Tom Coughlin and Jalen Ramsey could remedy this rift between them, then he wouldn't be traded anywhere. Then the Jacksonville Jaguars would be set. But if he, if they don't remedy it, Ramsey's gone. And other suitors include, I think the Kansas City Chiefs are in this. I've heard Oakland Raiders. Um, there's an NFC team I heard. I don't remember who it was now. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles, that's who it was. There are other suitors. I mean, you look at those teams. Aside from the Oakland Raiders, they're not going anywhere. They're looking for a long-term rebuild, finding guys Gruden can work with. But the Kansas City Chiefs, Philadelphia Eagles, these are Super Bowl contenders. To make a trade of this caliber in Week 3 or Week 4, whenever it actually happens now, it would probably be before Week 4. He can't play again this week. To make a trade of this caliber, your team would have to either be looking to completely rebuild like the Oakland Raiders or put all the chips in on a Super Bowl this year, because you'd be losing a first-round pick next year. The Oakland Raiders can afford to lose a first-round pick. They have picks galore after all of their trades with Khalil Mack, Amari Cooper, you know, that all happened. I think they still have um, first-round picks left over, if I'm not mistaken. But Baltimore's only got one first-round pick next year. If they give up a first and Hayden Hurst to get Ramsey then they are going all in for a Super Bowl this year. And again, this is conjecture to say that they would even trade Hayden Hurst away. It just seems like the most logical person, unless they gave a first and a third round pick or whatever for Ramsey and called it a day. It didn't give away Hurst at all. Entirely possible they do that. Um, but I think it would be very interesting to see Baltimore trade, and then there's a huge upside to make him to make this one of the best secondaries on paper of all time. But the downside is that Jalen Ramsey is off the chain sometimes. And I don't know if he would bode well with Harbaugh. Ed Reed had arguments with Harbaugh. There was a near mutiny caused by 
Reed and Bernard Pollard back in the, the 2012 season, when they actually won the, ended up winning the Super Bowl that year, a near mutiny. Harbaugh doesn't put up with a lot of the antics that Jalen Ramsey has gone through. I mean, people were suggesting that we go out and get Antonio Brown after the Pittsburgh Steelers were going to trade him, and I said no. And then he gets cut by Oakland, I said no. He's not going to mesh well with Harbaugh. That's a concern I have about Jalen Ramsey here in Baltimore. Do I think that it would be a deal breaker for the Ravens? I don't think so because I think that Ramsey coming into Baltimore, in all honesty, would would probably tone down the antics because this is this is, you know, the Ravens. This is an organization that's bigger than him at this point. I mean, it's one thing to play for the Jaguars, and no disrespect to the Jaguars. But the Jaguars have accomplished nothing in their 20-plus years in NFL history. The Ravens have accomplished two Super Bowl wins. They've had the best defenses basically year in and year out. Whether they're ranked number one or top five, top ten, they're always there. They've had three coaches in, in, their, in the entire organizational history. One coach was here for like three or four, four years, Ted Marchabrota. The other two coaches were, were here for basically a decade. So... Actually, a little less for Billick. But when you when you come into an organization like the Ravens, when, like Baltimore, you will realize that they are bigger than you and you no longer get to dictate the terms that you're living on, that you're working on. It's no longer Ramsey's decision to go off the chain and, and, and go on an interview bashing every quarterback in the league. It's no longer Ramsey's decision. It's just he'd have to fit in. And if he doesn't fit in, then the Ravens would have a, a very big problem on their hands because if he did not assimilate into Ravens culture, they would not be able to really leave him on this defense and keep it together. But the Ravens were able to survive with characters like Ed Reed, and I'm not comparing Ed Reed's behavior to, to Jalen Ramsey. But Ed Reed didn't get along with Harbaugh all the time. Bernard Pollard seriously didn't get along with Harbaugh at all, but they made it through. So again, I'm on the fence here about Jalen Ramsey. The I on paper, on paper, I'd be all for it, but the implications of him coming into the team and the locker room, I'm not exactly sure. And again, I don't really, I don't know Jalen Ramsey personally. I've never met Jalen Ramsey. I don't know how I'll fit into this locker room. But what we do know right now is that his behavior displayed in Jacksonville is less than ideal. It's less than ideal. The good news is he likes Lamar Jackson. We know that from that interview. He he went on bashing every quarterback, including Flacco and uh, the Manning, and I think Dak, too. Dak Prescott got hit. Um, But he did like Lamar, and at least you'd have that going for you, where he'd be at least in on the offensive side of the football, even though he doesn't play offense. He'd he'd approve of it, and they, there probably wouldn't be any trouble there. That's the good news um, with Jalen Ramsey liking Lamar Jackson. So to move on from Jalen Ramsey now, let's take a look at the Baltimore Ravens game against the Arizona Cardinals. They just finished up, and I was at the game. It was the first home game of the year. Pretty exciting stuff, um, really, for the entire Ravens fans. And I projected the Ravens to win 31-13. to If you read preview and predictions on BaltimoreFeather.com, you'll know that. And, you know, I wasn't super confident that the Ravens were going to have a blowout style like they did in Miami. I don't think it's appropriate to have, it would have been appropriate to say, oh, well, they're going to drop 59 points again two consecutive weeks. It wasn't going to happen. Arizona's not as bad as Miami. Arizona might not be a great team, but they are not the complete tanking team that the Miami Dolphins are who basically have decided to pursue the number one overall pick that is the decision the Miami Dolphins have made it's very clear to anybody who's paying attention um, they're not trying to win they're trying to lose um, and they've traded away all their good players except for Xavier Howard for, for whatever reason he's the only one left at least they made the right decision to start Josh Rosen this upcoming week because Fitzpatrick, you know, what's he going to do for you? Anyway, the Baltimore Ravens didn't really do well enough, in my opinion, against the Cardinals. I mean, a win's a win. 
Period. A win is a win. But to allow the Cardinals to hang around as long as the Ravens did was very disappointing. Baltimore had a 17-6 point lead right before halftime. And they choked it away in the second half. It was a three-point game with a few minutes left to go. And the Ravens, I mean, they I don't want to say they barely escaped, but it was a less than ideal situation that the Ravens had to go through that. That Baltimore basically said, well, not that they said like, oh, let's just let them hang around. But the fact is the Ravens did not put the Cardinals away when they had the chance. They didn't. They just, it was very disappointing. I mean, the first drive of the game, looked like it was part of that Miami beatdown from the previous week. It looked straight out of that game. Like you just extracted the drive, changed the opponent's uniforms and the stadium, and that's the same It's the same exact um, game. They just drove down the field, seven plays, like 94 yards. 93 of it came in the air by Jackson, unheard of from last year. Walked down the field and scored. And you could feel it in the crowd. The entire stadium was literally shaking. You could feel it shaking, moving back and forth. That's how excited everybody was. But from that point on, I mean, it got dimmer and dimmer. And there were points where I thought the Ravens were actually going to lose the game. They never lost the lead. But when it closed to three points, I was thinking to myself, this is not how you handle the Cardinals. This is not how you handle any team. When you have a 17-6 lead and you let it get diminished to three points, in the fourth quarter with plenty of time left to win. It, it, it was disappointing. Um, the Ravens retaliated to that um, lowering, smallering, smallering, uh, whatever, you know, lowering of that deficit with a field goal. Not a touchdown, a field goal. And that was another mistake. The Ravens weren't able to capitalize on drives. They were able to capitalize against the Dolphins. And maybe the the Cardinals' defense is just better. Maybe the Ravens' offense wasn't as well prepared against the Cardinals. I don't know. But it they really should have won by by 10 points. I mean, I know they got into the, the red zone at the end of the game. They didn't need to score, so they just knelt the ball down. Whatever. But that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't mean much because at the end of the day, the Cardinals had a chance to win. Now, what is interesting, though, is when the Cardinals made it a three-point game and then the Ravens retaliated with that field goal to make it a six-point game again, the Cardinals were lighting up the defense in the second half, just torching it, 80-yard drives, you know, everything. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the defense stopped them. Like, it was two three-and-outs, if I remember correctly. And that was it in the fourth. Like, the... Right after the last time they scored, it was two like three and outs or you know a first down and, and, and then a three and out. That was it. And there was one of those two drives at the end of the game. They held them for negative yards. Remarkable performance by the defense when it counted. I will give them that. The offense, though, wasn't able to put the points on the board that they needed to to safely win this game in the third quarter in the first half. The Ravens had an opportunity, actually, to win the game in the first half when you think about it because... They could have scored when the game was 17-6. to They could have went on a touchdown. And instead, I mean, they, they started like the 45-yard line, their own 45-yard line. So it's great field position with like three, four minutes left. Fantastic field position. They start, I think they got a first down or something. But it was a holding on, on, on Orlando Brown. Ten yards going backwards. Then... Lamar Jackson gets sacked for like six yards. And then on third down, Matt Skura botches the snap. And Marshall Yonda, being the only one who was paying any attention that entire drive, fell on the on the ball knowing that if he didn't, the Cardinals would have gotten it and probably scored. So, I mean, it was like a negative, when all said and done, it was like negative 11 yards that, game, that play, that, that drive. So when you... When you look at that, I mean, the Ravens had a chance to go down the field and score, make it from six, 17 to 6 to at least 23, 24 to 6, depending on if they made the extra point. It's automatic, so, you know, for Tucker. So, you know, he probably would have made it. So 24 to 6. The game would have been over. I mean, there's no way the Cardinals would have come back on that one. 
they didn't score enough points. So instead, you go negative 11 yards, and you basically almost hand the ball to the Cardinals, saying, take it. Just take it and go score. Luckily, Marshall Yonda actually knew what was going on, and like the rest of the offense at that point, and fell on the ball, preventing a turnover. Baltimore would have been Baltimore's first turnover. They haven't turned the ball over at all this season. Would have been their first turnover on the year. Uh, Marshall Yonda knew what was coming and stopped that. I mean, I don't know how much I can actually complain about this win because it's a win, right? The Ravens did their job in the end. They were able to outscore the Cardinals, although it was risky, although they let them hang around. They were able to outscore the Cardinals. The defense did its job at the, the final two drives of the game. And Marquise Brown made a tremendous catch on the sideline to basically seal the game. Um, went downfield, and they were able to burn the clock out after that. It was a tremendous catch. I'm sure you'll remember it if you even watched the game. You know exactly what catch I'm talking about down the far sideline if you're watching on TV. So... Marquise Brown, I mean, was really one of the really shining moments of the entire game. He was a shining player. Mark Andrews was a great player that game. Another 100-yard receiving game. Lamar looked a little sloppier than he did in Miami, but leaps and bounds ahead of last year. But it is disappointing, again, that Ravens weren't able to sustain drives like they did in Miami. Didn't finish enough with touchdowns. And that's simply... What happened against the Cardinals? Not enough touchdowns. Too many missed opportunities. Let them hang around too long. Um, But in the end, again, they won the game. And, I mean, there's not much more I can actually talk about that with. Because they won the game. That's all that matters. In the end, letting the Cardinals hang around, putting me through a heart attack, doesn't actually matter. Because... They left the stadium with a win. And the stadium they're going to have to win next weekend, if they want to win, is Kansas City. And Arrowhead Stadium, you know, it's the most, it's the loudest in the NFL. I believe it holds the record. It was going back and forth with Seattle Stadium for a while. Can the Baltimore Ravens beat the Kansas City Chiefs? That's the question we all want to know the answer to, because last year it was Lamar Jackson's only loss in the regular season. Kansas City. It was a great game. It was probably one of the Ravens' best games of the year. Um, I think I, I liked the the game against New Orleans a little better just because I was there. But the game in Kansas City was very, very competitive. It was back and forth. The defense actually did a decent job holding the, M- the would-be MVP to, I don't remember how many yards it was, but it wasn't the performance he put up against any other team. I'll, t- I'll give him that. So... The Ravens are going to go in for a rematch, and this is already being hyped up as the game of the week, essentially, in national media, in in local media. Everybody's excited for this game. I don't know if the Ravens can beat the Chiefs. I don't know. There's too many questions for me. They beat two teams that are not good. Not, I mean, the Cardinals aren't bad, but they're not good. They beat the Miami Dolphins, who are the worst, absolute worst team maybe this league has ever seen. I mean, it's it's bad. Can they beat the Chiefs? These, I mean, these are the guys who went to the AFC Championship last year. These are the guys who have the reigning MVP on their team. These are the guys, I mean, this is the most dynamic offense that that's in the NFL right now is the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't think Tyreek Hill is going to play. We'll talk about those injuries, their injuries later. Um... But Sammy Watkins has burst onto the scene. Like, where does Sammy Watkins come from? He was so disappointing his first few years. And now all of a sudden in Kansas City, he's like one of the leading receivers in the league, top five. Where did that come from? Their defense is much improved. If they get a hold of Ramsey, actually, he can't play. He can't play this week. So it doesn't matter now. But if they had a hold of Ramsey, this would be crazy. They've got Kyle, Kendall Fuller, who we're going to talk about. There's just... it's. It's just going to be a tough matchup, and maybe it's the matchup that the Ravens are going to be able to take advantage of, and some people think it will be, because the way the Ravens are built, 
you have a team that can slice you through the air and, 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 and slash you on the ground too. I mean, this is a team that knows how to move the ball in many different dimensions. Kansas City's defense isn't really that good. I mean, it's, it's good. It's not spectacular, though. If they play the time of possession game, if they play for time of possession against the Chiefs, they definitely will have a strategic advantage in that department. And when you win time of possession battles, you take time away from Pat Mahomes and the offense to continually drive on you, to score on you, and their mistakes get amplified when you win time of possession Let's say Pat Mahomes throws an interception. It wouldn't matter so much if they were winning time of possession 40 minutes to 20 minutes, but if you're winning it 40 minutes to 20 minutes, then that interception is going to be big because they don't have as many other opportunities to score as as maybe they would have if they were winning the time of possession battle. They wouldn't have as many drives because they're not scoring fast enough because you're holding the ball for five, six, seven minutes of drive. Nine minutes to drive. There was like a nine-minute drive last week. Okay, so that's going to be crucial. It's time of possession, right? Can the Ravens hold on to the ball long enough for the Chiefs to be at a major disadvantage? That's number one. That's the biggest issue here. And it's going to be on the defense's shoulders here to do because they're going to have to get the ball. I mean, you know, the offense is going to have to keep the time up and waste the clock. But the defense is going to have to get the ball and force the turnovers, force the punts, everything like that. And and we got three players to watch here. We got on the Chiefs, Pat Mahomes, Sammy Watkins, Kendall Fuller. Pat Mahomes, how's he going to do against this Ravens defense? Can the Ravens defense force Pat Mahomes to give them the ball? Can the Ravens defense force him to, to give it to the punter and to punt the ball? Is this Ravens defense strong enough to go up against the reigning MVP and hold him to a performance like last year where he... Wasn't bad, but he was not Pat Mahomes. It wasn't the same Pat Mahomes we saw against other teams. That's all the Ravens need to do because this offense on the other side of the field, on the other side of the ball, can waste the clock. And this Kansas City Chiefs defense, I don't think, is 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 equipped to stop Lamar Jackson. I mean, Lamar Jackson is playing phenomenally, right? He can again, he can slice you through the air and dash you on the ground. The Ravens have Mark Ingram. They have Gus Edwards. They have Justice Hill on the ground, too. If the secondary shut down Marquise Brown, Mark Andrews, Willie Sneed, they're just running on the ground. And if that gets shut down, they're going back to the air. And it's going to be this constant dynamic we're going to see being played out against this Andy Reid defense, this Chiefs defense that... It's going to be it's a very different game than last year because last year the Ravens came in with Lamar Jackson. I mean, as as good as Lamar Jackson was last year to lead the Ravens to so many wins, he wasn't a passer yet. He wasn't the guy that we see right now. We see today. Now he is that guy. He is the guy that's able to throw for five touchdowns against the Dolphins. I know it's against the Dolphins, but five touchdowns is five touchdowns. He's able to Go two games without an interception. Seven touchdowns in two in two games, no interceptions. This isn't the same Laura Jackson. It might be the same Pat Mahomes, but it's certainly not the same Laura Jackson. Now, the Ravens defense doesn't have the same pass rush it had last year. It doesn't have CJ Mosley on the inside. It's it's missing some pieces, I'll give him that. But we have what looks like it's become a capable pass rush. Pernell McPhee's got two sacks on the air. Who would have saw that coming? Matt Judon's on the other side. These are capable, not pro ball guys, but capable guys. Patrick Onwaso in the middle of the field is capable. The secondary, though, of course, is our strongest point. No Jimmy Smith, though, is going to be a problem. That's going to be a big problem. Um, but Marlon Humphrey is a lockdown corner. Brandon Carr is one step under a lockdown corner. Anthony Averett is pretty good. I mean, he's young. It's only his second year, but he's good. He can do things for this Ravens secondary. So what's Pat Mahomes going to be able to do against his offense? I mean, the pass rush is not going to be terribly pressurized against him. It's not going to put so much pressure on him as it maybe did last year with Suggs and Darius Smith. Um, 
but the secondary should give him problems. But again, this is Pat Mahomes. He is the reigning MVP. He had a prolific year last year, his second year in the league, his first starting. Can this Ravens secondary lock him up? And if they can, they can win the time of possession battle with Lamar Jackson, with Willie Sneed and Mark Andrews and Marquise Brown through the air, and of course, Lamar Jackson again, Mark Andrews, Justice Hill, uh, and Gus Edwards on the ground. If they win time of possession, they can win this game. But, you know, they're also going to have to bottle up Sammy Watkins, our other player to, another player to watch here. Sammy Watkins has burst onto the field again this year. Not again. He burst on the field this year. I don't know what happened. Sammy Watkins with the Bills wasn't very, what's the word, spectacular. He wasn't spectacular for a first-round pick. He was not up to standards. Now, all of a sudden, Sammy Watkins comes onto the field with the Kansas City Chiefs and is a top-five receiver in receiving yards in the two, first two games. He looks like a completely different animal. I mean, this is, it, it's strange. But Sammy Watkins here, uh, another is a player to watch. And another player to watch I want to see, not to just jump too quickly here, is Kendall Fuller, the corner. He's going to have to go up against Marquise Brown. Can he keep up with Hollywood? It's a legitimate question. Probably not. The answer is, probably, the answer is always probably not for anybody who's covering Hollywood here. Who, where do we think Fuller is going to be able to do anything though I mean maybe they don't prepare him against Brown and that's fine I don't care it's just more room for Brown but he's going to be their number one corner against these guys out here who is he going to pair up against and how is he going to play if it's Brown he's not going to be able to catch up he's going to have to do something else stay back I don't know give up short gains to bottom up long maybe that's a strategy against Brown Maybe he just plays up and gets burnt all the time to prevent the short gains. Who knows? But he's going to be the guy that's going to go up against probably Brown. It could be Sneed, though. It could be... I mean, they could put him on Andrews a few times. But he's really going to be their entire secondary here without Jalen Ramsey. Because even if they trade for Jalen Ramsey, he's not playing. Not playing. Um, so those are the players on the Chiefs to watch. Now, there are going to be other guys that you're going to want to watch, you know, Obviously, Travis Kelsey and, and everything, but Travis Kelsey's on the injured injured uh, status here, and he's going to play probably. He's a full participant, but I do want to go through the nine players on the Kansas City injured um, list here and discuss their status. Now, Eric Fisher, the tackle who was drafted first overall, and I believe it was 2013 maybe, uh, did not participate Thursday. Tyreek Hill has not participated in practice on since Thursday. Uh, Tyreek Hill is definitely not going to play. Eric Fisher, I don't know about. Uh, LaShawn McCoy was limited. He might or might not play. I was thinking about making him one of the players to watch, but just because he might not play, who knows. Damian Williams, kind of disappointing so far this year, did not participate at all in practice. The running back out of Alabama in his first year. Uh, La Laurent Dufresne Tardif was a full participant. He's a guard. Cameron Irving, full participant. Travis Kelsey, full participant. Pat Mahomes, full participant, and Demarcus Robinson is also a full participant in the Kansas City Thursday practice. So key takeaways, obviously, Eric Fisher is going to be somebody they want to have on their line. He's a little bit more controversial of, of a player in Kansas City just because of, you know, hasn't been the most effective um, tackle for them over the years since being drafted, but he's kind of moved up a little bit in the ranks. Um, Tyreek Hill is not going to play. He's their speed guy. I don't, I don't care what you think about Tyreek Hill off the field. I mean, we can have that discussion for another day. But Tyreek Hill on the field, a speed burner, and is a danger for this Ravens secondary. He will not play. LaShawn McCoy might not play. And if he doesn't play, then does Damian Williams play? Because he's not participating in practice either. So, I mean, and you know the Kansas City Chiefs aren't going to try to run the ball on you. That's not their mode. I mean, it's not the days of Jamal Charles anymore. They're not here to ground and pound. They're here to slice and dice through the air, and that's what Pat Mahomes... Pat Mahomes is, is going to play. Travis Kelsey should play. Sammy Watkins is going to play. He's not even on the list. So they have guys who can slice and dice you through the air, but Tyreek Hill is, might actually be the X-factor. Him not playing might be the X-factor for the Baltimore Ravens here. 
because of they don't have that downfield threat, Pat Mahomes isn't going to have to use or is going to be able to use this cannon as much as maybe he would have with Tyreek Hill in this offense um, this Sunday. So those are the guys playing. Um, those are the injured players for Kansas City, uh, and we will see whether or not some of them are playing or not um, this upcoming Sunday when the inactives list comes out. So without further ado, we're going to end the podcast here today. Again, not a whole lot of Ravens need to talk about, just more opinionated things, and we will update you if the Ravens end up getting Jalen Ramsey. Um, And if you're looking for my predictions for the Kansas City Chiefs game uh, in Kansas City at Arrowhead Field this Sunday, make sure you um, check out BaltimoreFeather.com. Hopefully it will come out tomorrow on Saturday. Um, Looking to get Ravens retrospective review for week one and week two. Of course, the film reviews of the games out this weekend as well. We'll let you know if they come out. Um, And, of course, you can find us at BeMoreFeather on Twitter, at NestTalk, or at Chris Linfont for myself, my own personal account on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook, search up NestTalk, or the Baltimore Feather on Facebook. Um, And, of course, subscribe on the YouTube channel, subscribe on iTunes, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Make sure you find us there and subscribe us to us, um, rate us, give us some feedback. And finally, sign up for the newsletter on BaltimoreFeather.com for the latest and greatest Ravens news and opinion articles by yours truly. We will see you next week as we recap the Kansas City Chiefs game and look forward to the second home game of the year against the rival Cleveland Browns. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and we will see you next week on the next episode of Nest Talk.